Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, CellDive, a robust platform for multiplexed whole slide imaging and single cell analysis. I am Jennifer Woods of LabRoots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Leica Microsystems. To learn more, visit LeicaMicrosystems.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speaker, Melinda Angus Hill, PhD, Lead Scientist, Application Manager, CellDive. For a full biography of our speaker, please click on the Biography tab at the top right of your screen. Dr. Angus Hill, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you for the introduction. I'd like to start today by thanking you for attending this Labs Roots webinar today, where I'll focus on a scientific example of what can be done using CellDive. The title is CellDive, a re robust platform for multiplexed whole slide imaging and single cell analysis. I did this work in collaboration with my colleague, Dr. Prashant Dampurdi, a staff software engineer for CellDive at Leica. Today's talk focuses on a current study of multiple immune-relevant biomarkers used in, mul in multiplex to probe a colon cancer tumor microarray sample. I'll start by providing an overview of the genetic, clinical, and molecular characterization of colon cancer and how this work helps put immunotherapeutic successes and also challenges into perspective. I'll also highlight future work that's required to improve colon cancer immunotherapy for all colon cancer patients. While this talk is focused on colon cancer specifically, cancer researchers in general will be asking similar questions depending on the current state of research in their field. So related to CellDive, I'll present data from a colon cancer study using a single tumor microarray slide to probe dozens of tissues and dozens of biomarkers in multiplex. The ability to explore multiple biomarkers at the single cell level on a single TMA section is very powerful. Additionally, we've partnered with Indica Labs with their HALO platform to analyze complex biomarker expression at the single cell level across large tissue samples. So ultimately, multiplexed single cell biomarker expression coupled with cellular spatial location can provide essential information for understanding tissue heterogeneity and for research and development of future therapies. Sporadic colorectal cancer is a very heterogeneous disease with subtypes that are characterized by specific clinical and molecular features. 85% of all sporadic colon cancers exhibit chromosomal instability or SIN, including chromosomal rearrangements, also loss or gain of segments, and loss of heterozygosity. Here, the earliest mutation is in the APC gene and the canonical Wnt signaling pathway followed by various additional oncogenic mutations, including changes in RAS and the P53 tumor suppressor gene. Apart from the 85% of colorectal cancers that are SIN, the remaining 15% have high microsatellite instability phenotypes, or MSI. Microsatellites are regions of tandem re repeats of repetitive DNA sequence, and patients with high MSI colorectal cancer have frequent replication errors, and sporadic forms of MSI tumors are uh, commonly exhibit RAF mutations, and uh, CPG island hypermethylation, or SIMP, including methylation and silencing of the mismatch repair gene, or MLH1. And familial MSI cases are called Lynch syndrome, and they account for 5% of all colorectal cancer cases. And patients arbor mutations in the mismatch repair genes MLH1 and MSH2. So current standard of care uses these tumor subtypes to stratify colon cancer patients for therapy. But even within these molecular features that define these subtypes, 
there's still significant heterogeneity. One source of that heterogeneity is the immune microenvironment within the tumor. There is variation in whether tumors are immune competent or whether they lack significant immune cell infiltration. So knowledge of an immune cell status is essential since immunotherapy relies on the immune cells activation within the tumor microenvironment. For example, several, several immunotherapies target the immune checkpoint inhibitors such as PD-1, LAG-3, and CTLA-4. Immunotherapy has been at the forefront of new treatments for a variety of cancers. For example, immunotherapy is clinically efficacious in melanoma and also lung cancer. But unfortunately, immunotherapies have only shown benefit in a very small fraction of colon colorectal cancer patients specifically within the subset of patients with high microsatellite instability, or MSHH, that I described earlier. Phase three clinical trial data from the Keynote 177 trial elevated Merck's Keytruda in patients with unresectable or metastatic colorectal cancer with high microsatellite instability or mismatch repair deficiency. So with this trial, progression-free survival of over 50% was a very significant improvement over the conventional chemotherapies for this late stage of disease. And so these uh, results led to the rapid approval of Keytruda as a first-line therapy in June of 2020. Perhaps most importantly, this success highlights the need to go beyond common tumor genesis markers to start to define additional biomarkers that can help to stratify patients that will respond to immunotherapy. For example, while the Keytruda study notes efficacy in patients with MSHH or mismatch repair deficient tumors, only a small subset of patients of those patients show treatment benefits. So stratifying patients by MSI or MMR is, is, in, is insufficient to avoid unnecessary treatments for patients who won't respond to the therapy. So recent efforts aimed at developing new methods to characterize the various subtypes of colorectal cancer are ongoing. For example, the consensus molecular subtypes, or CMS, classifies colorectal cancer into four molecular subtypes with distinct characteristics to better identify key therapeutic targets and also predict therapeutic response. The CMS was developed through a consortium and overlays molecular and clinical features of colorectal cancer that I described earlier with, M with mRNA expression. So importantly, this comparison starts to allow subtyping by immune cell status of the tumor. CMS2 is the canonical subtype with epithelial correct, uh, characteristics and activated Wnt signaling, including APC mutation. C CMS1 encompasses the high microsatellite instability tumors that were successfully targeted by immunotherapy, and not surprisingly, they have significant immune cell activation. CMS3 subtype is epithelial with metabolic dysregulation, and CMS4 subtype demonstrates epithelial to mesenchymal transition, or EMT, stromal invasion, and also angiogenesis. So while the CMS system is an improvement that may help to stratify colon cancer patients, the CMS system is not part of current clinical care. So retrospective studies of the relevance of the CMS system are ongoing. For example, can CMS help define subsets of patients where treatments may be beneficial, or can CMS help identify additional therapeutic tar targets? Retrospective analysis using these CMS-specific biomarkers um, can help define molecular changes in a given CMS before treatment, following treatment, and also in the case of resistance to treatment. For example, for immunotherapy, a collection of immune, of immune cell biomarkers can help stratify CMS1 and CMS4 tumors where there are significant immune cells present from CMS2 and CMS3, which are largely considered immune cell deserts. These types of studies are essential to define the usefulness of the CMS biomarker studies and CMS-specific therapies for future clinical trials and then ultimately for clinical practice. So from the clinical perspective, a significant challenge is to identify those patients' tumors with molecular functional and also stromal characteristics that are predictive of potential response to immunotherapy. And from a research perspective, the question remains, why are immunotherapies effective against MMR defective and MSI high metastatic tumors? 
Robust subtyping is essential for understanding similarities and differences between the tumors, and there's ongoing research to understand the molecular mechanisms of CMS1 tumors that contribute to the immunogenicity and beneficial therapeutic response of these patients. So another question is, is it possible to render non-responsive tumors immune competent? Currently, there are clinical trials that are exploring whether immune checkpoint inhibitors combined with radiotherapy or chemotherapy may have therapeutic benefits for non-MSI high tumors. And then finally, are there biomarkers that will help stratify patients when immunotherapy will be effective? And are there additional biomarkers that may be effective as an indication for therapy? Multiplexed immunofluorescence enables researchers to define whether biomarkers may be therapeutically relevant. So cell dive multiplexed imaging technology allows researchers to spatially map biomarkers of interest on a single tissue slide and provides a complete map of biomarker expression at the single cell level. Multiplexed imaging can explore features that define the tumor microenvironment, including immune cell inf infiltration and activation or inhibition inhibition state, oncogenic and metabolic biomarkers, stromal infiltration, EMT, vascularization, and also wound response. The cell dive multiplexed imaging solution is a multi-step cyclical workflow for sample preparation, paraffin removal, slide clearing, and antigen retrieval. They're all completed and then followed by an initial round of background imaging. A virtual H&E image is created use, using a patented process, and a region or regions of interest are selected. So any FFPE sample can be imaged as a small region of interest, or the entire uh, tissue on a slide, or as a tissue from multiple patients that are collected and sectioned in a tissue microarray format. The ROIs are then captured throughout the remainder of the imaging cycle. For multiplexing, repeated cycles of autofluorescence imaging, staining, biomarker imaging, and signal inactivation are performed to collect millions of data points for each biomarker. And then automated image processing and alignment occur in the background. And then for analysis, we've partnered with Indica Labs using HALO to visualize segment cells, extract features, and also analyze the data to determine the abundance and localization of specified biomarkers for comprehensive spatial mapping. For this study, we used the cell dive solution to examine biomarker expression across multiple colon adenocarcinoma samples arrayed on a single slide, or a colon cancer tumor array, or TMA. Shown here is a cell dive virtual H&E of a commercially available colon TMA from Pentomics. This TMA has multiple adenocarcinomas, mucinous adenocarcinomas, adenomas, polyps, and normal, uh, normal colon samples. For this colon TMA study, we probed multiple biomarkers, four per round for nine rounds for a total of 36 biomarkers. And then DAPI enables the registration between rounds. For analysis, a subset of, of 18 biomarkers was used, and those are categorized as immune cell markers, tumor markers, markers essential for tissue and cell segmentation. Um, these are shown here in a halo image, um, the staining of 11 biomarkers across a TMA. Halo is used as an image viewer, but it's also powerful for image analysis. For classification, segmentation, and spatial analysis, there are several HALO modules that were used, including the HALO TMA, classifier, Hyplex FL, and spatial analysis modules. Here I've zoomed in on specific cores in the TMA. HALO displays cell staining across multiple markers in colon adenoma, adenocarcinoma, mucinous adenocarcinoma, and normal colon. Here is a zoom of each tumor core within the TMA compiled in an 8 by 12 format. And the tumor cores from the same patient are easily identified across pathologies. For example, here highlighted in yellow are some of the adenocarcinoma cores from the same patient that are qualitatively similar based on biomarker expression. And then here boxed in red are some adenocarcinoma cores that are qualitatively distinct within the same patient. And this is possibly due to intratumoral heterogeneity. 
We can quantify these differences using the tissue classification module in HALO. We utilize one set of biomarkers known to be specific for epithelial cells and a second set of markers for defining cells within the stroma. HALO uses color and texture information from the marker images as inputs to a random forest algorithm to classify tissue into different compartments. In the first column is an image of the fluorescent whole TMA and also a zoomed image of a single adenocarcinoma core. And then in the next column, HALO has classified all the cores within the TMA and then the same adenocarcinoma core is classified with masks that represent the specific compartment with epithelium in red and stroma in green. It's important to note that we trained the classifier across a few representative cores from all of the different pathologies. And then after training, the classifier successfully classified regions in all of the TMA cores. Looking closer at specific cores, here are adenocarcinoma cores from four patients, two cores per patient. Data analysis revealed samples with a higher percentage of tumor infiltrating stroma than epithelium in the first panel, or very low levels of tumor infiltrating stroma compared to epithelium shown in the second panel. It's important to note that the similarities within patients and how patients can be clustered based on tumor infiltrating stroma levels um, is, a, is very powerful. For example, here, the stromal or epithelial comportment size was plotted against adenocarcinoma samples, and tumors with higher stroma to epithelial ratio are easily identified compared to those tumors with a low stroma to epithelial ratio. Next, for each core, we defined phenotypic differences in single cells in the tumor microenvironment. We analyzed 29 phenotypic combinations of six immune markers and CD44 at the single cell level. Cells are segmented based on fluorescent markers, and the data for cells that co-express additional markers or phenotypes is visualized and then recorded for downstream analysis. Halo cell segmentation uses conventional nuclear and cell size parameters coupled with intensity from stains that differentially mark cellular compartments, including the nuclear cytoplasm and membrane within the stromal and epithelial compartments. And then HALO defines each marker's expression in every segmented cell, and cells that exhibit a specific expression of phenotypes are visualized along with the segmentation mask. And then the tabulated data is also provided for downstream analysis in other programs like R. It's hard to see here, but segmented cells with various phenotypes are colored differently depending on the cell phenotype. This slide shows hierarchical clustering of adenocarcinoma samples based on the percent distribution of the various cell phenotypes. This analysis enables visualization of clusters that exhibit similar phenotypes. For example, for epithelial compartments on the left and the stromal compartments on the right, these clusters highlight regions with a general lack of immune cells. Additionally, this analysis suggests that the key Truda immunotherapy, which targets the PD-1 pathway, may only be effective in a small subset of samples because T cells expressing PD-1 are largely absent from these tumors. Next, we can combine each cell's phenotype with each cell's spatial location in both the stromal and epithelial compartments. We plot the center of each segmented epithelial cell and overlay the cell's position and specific phenotype for spatial analysis. The figure on the left shows the spatial analysis for all 96 cores, and on the right are single cores of normal and adenocarcinoma samples. Here, varying symbols for phenotypes are visible and highlight a few of the different immune cell phenotypes. For example, the location of PD-1 positive CD8 positive tumor infiltrating lymphocytes present in the epithelial compartment. The same analysis is shown here for immune cell phenotypes in the stromal compartment of the same normal and adenocarcinoma samples. So I highlighted a few adenocarcinoma samples with CD8 positive, PD1 positive cells in the epithelial compartments. Next, we will further analyze one sample using spatial analysis. In the first panel, we map cells with these phenotypes in both the epithelial and stromal compartments. In gray, SOX9 is expressed in tumor cells. We calculate a proximity analysis between tumor infiltrating CD8 positive, PD1 positive cells and SOX9 positive tumor cells, and then maps those onto the second panel's image. 
Here, CD8 positive PD1 positive cell, uh, cell centers are labeled magenta and are close to the SOX9 tumor cell centers in gray. And then finally, in the last panel, these spatial distances are mapped across the entire core and tabulated for additional analysis. Proximity analysis enables researchers to define the position of all PD-1 positive T cells relative to tumor cells. So in summary, colon cancer is a particularly challenging disease for Im immunotherapy given tumor heterogeneity. And stratification of tumors by molecular subtype may help define tumors where treatments will have a therapeutic benefit and also help define new markers for therapy. Multiplexed immunofluorescence with CellDive enables the imaging of multiple biomarkers on a single slide. And then the precise image processing allows the exploration of co-expression of multiple biomarkers or phenotypes in single cells. Indica Labs Halo platform supports visualization and analysis of cell dive images, including robust classification and cell segmentation algorithms that can be combined with analysis tools for phenotyping and spatial analysis. So taken together, the cell dive solution allows deep contextual analysis of multiple cancer tissues on a single slide and provides new insights into cancer tissue heterogeneity. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you for your time. Now I'll open up for questions. Thank you, Dr. Angus Hill, for your informative presentation. We will now welcome Dr. Prashant Dumpuri to join us for the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you would like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question is, is the choice of biomarkers a trial and error method? So we have a validated antibody list that's uh, part of the cell dive solution that consists of 350 validated antibodies that you can purchase from vendors, from um, well-respected vendors. These are validated to work with the cell dive process. So which antibodies you use from the antibody list or whether you want to use your own antibodies and validate them, that's all up to you. Um, they can be chosen as, as part of the study design process, can be tested on a small batch and then also can then be used on larger batches. So whatever antibody you like is purely up to you. Thank you, Dr. Angus Hill. Our next question is, can this method be used to identify metastases? Also, can it be used to identify two different cancers in the same patient, such as both adenoma and carcinoma slash lymphoma? Thank you. Uh, I think that's a really good question. So, so perhaps, you know, the TMA might be a really good option for this type of study where uh, these different um, cancer types can be uh, cores from these different cancer types can be analyzed at the same time on the same slide. But cell dive is a research-only solution, but the methods that we use are really common immunofluorescent methods that you are pro likely already using in the lab. So if you're able to identify metastasis using a set of biomarkers uh, currently, then this can also be done using cell dive. But cell dive is powerful because in addition to that small set of biomarkers you may be using, you can add additional biomarkers um, to that so that you can explore new questions, new hypothesis-driven questions that you may be interested in exploring. All right, thank you again, Dr. Angus Hill. Our next question, do you have to conjugate any antibodies or are all 350 pre-conjugated? So we do not actually supply the final antibodies. So the, these are purchased from vendors. Um, and we, we have a, a list of antibodies. It's a 350 um, antibody list. And in order for, in order to do um, multiplexing, we, we do rely on conjugation of antibodies. So some of those are supplied as commercial conjugates, but most can be conjugated yourself. And we supply a manual that describes this process and the best way to conjugate antibodies consistently. Um, so it's really a good solution because it, it enables you the flexibility to, for you to choose the biomarkers that you want to study. 
All right, thank you again. Our next question, can this method be used to identify other cancer other than colon cancer? Um, the, so yes, so the um, cell dive is not only useful for colon cancer, but it's also useful for other types of cancers. Um, it also can be used just for um, human disease. So any time that you need to spatially map any uh, sort of co-expression of different biomarkers at the single cell level, if you're looking for any type of microenvironment, um, cell dive can be useful. So this is useful beyond the cancer field, is that correct? Yes, beyond the cancer field, yep. Perfect, thank you. And, and multiple types of cancer and beyond the cancer field, thank you. Oh, amazing, thank you. Okay, the next question, is this based in direct or indirect fluorescence or both? Um, Sorry, was that, is it placed <laughs> in direct and indirect, all one, all one word? <laughs> Um, I don't really understand that question, but um, basically the dyes are conjugated to the antibody. So uh, we, we have a, a linear uh, visualization of biomarker expression, um, but I, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't understand that question. Maybe we could get clarification for that sure. question. Yeah, sure. If the questioner would like to clarify, that would be amazing, or maybe your question was answered, then that's fine too. We'll move on to the next question. How are the nuclear parameters for segmentation adjusted for different types of cells and tissues? Okay, thank you for asking that. So multiplexing allows staining with multiple biomarkers, and any biomarkers that enable compartmentalization of the tissue should be included in your study design. This ensures that cells which look different can be segmented using different nuclear parameters. In addition, we also wanted to point out that HALO's classification module allows one to compartmentalize different tissue types. And you can then use the HyFlex module in HALO to tune segmentation parameters for each compartment based on the shape and the size of average cell in that particular compartment. Thank you, Dr. Dumpuri. Um, we have a few more questions here. What are the pros and cons of staining tissue in the TMA format compared to a single tissue format? I think that's a really good question, and it, it sort of is based on your study needs. So the pros for TMA staining are that uh, you can include positive and negative controls uh, on the array, and then you can also add multiple samples from the same patient. and also from multiple additional patients. So this provides the ability to directly compare the expression patterns across patients and control samples. So the cons would be mostly related to tumor heterogeneity. So the, the issue, um, if, if you have a heterogeneous tumor, you want to really be careful when you assemble the array to make sure that you choose the right tumor regions or that you uh, fully explore that tumor. So for example, um, if you have high intratumoral heterogeneity where tissue cores are vastly different from other cores from the same patient, it can contribute to irreproduci irreproducibility of results. So basically your results are not reproducible. Um, and so you'd like to standardize the tissue sampling across distinct areas within that same tumor for each patient. Um, so the, also, but if you did have that issue, you could combine the data from multiple cores to reflect the biomarker heterogeneity in, the, in that data. So if tumor heterogeneity within the tumor is a problem, then you might want to consider full tumor sections rather than tumor cores. Thank you, Dr. Angus Hill. Looks like we have time for one more question. What kind of stainer do you use? Is manual stain okay? And if so, does the system have a high quality requirement for the staining? So uh, those are two really good questions. I think um, CellDive is really flexible in that you can 
really stain the slides any way you wish to. So you can either do it on a bench top manually um, and use a, a humidity chamber, or you can use an automate, automated stainer. Um, these will commonly stain, you know, 30 slides at a time. Um, or you could use a liquid handler. Uh, we have a, a an open well system that that I didn't discuss today, um, but it basically allows for this for you to wash and incubate the slide without a cover slip, and so you're able to um, to to basically leave the slide in place, and it, you can go through all of the slides and, and washes um, in place. And you can either do that by hand, or you can have a liquid handling robot that will do that. So it's really uh, sky's the limit on the way that you stain the slides. Um, the second question about does the system, um, can you tell whether the staining worked with the system? Um, we actually have quality control steps built into the software. So if you find that you've stained slides and the staining didn't work or um, the staining wasn't optimal or you had some imaging artifacts or anything like that, you can fail the QC, fix the problem, and re-image. So um, once you've started um, the process, you, we have these built-in QCs so that you can stop if you do have a problem and, and fix the problem. Thank you, Dr. Angus Hill. Do you have any final comments for our audience? Um, yeah, I I really like to thank you for this opportunity, and I'd like to thank you all for your time. If you'd like more information about CellDive, you can click on the resource tab um, uh, available on your screen. And have a nice day. Well, thank you again, Dr. Melinda Angus Hill, for your time today, and also to Dr. Prashant Dumpuri for joining us during the Q and A. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Leica Microsystems, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.